Can kids understand the King James Version? I did, or I thought I did. Now I know that I did and I didn't. I understood most of what I read, but some of it I did not. Some words in the King James, some sentences that I read repeatedly and even memorized as a child, I misunderstood because of language change over four plus centuries. I thought I was understanding, but I wasn't. That's what a false friend is. I'm gonna give an example, and I'm gonna actually pull real live actual kids, kids who have all grown up in church, to see if they make the same mistake that I did. I bet they will, but I promise I will show their answers even if they're right. I'm gonna use the kids that I happen to have on hand while visiting my sister here in beautiful Hawaii. I have not coached these kids. That is, I have told them to simply answer me honestly whatever I ask. No kids are hearing the answers that are given by other kids before they give their answers. We will start with the young ladies, then we will give the boys a chance to answer. All of these kids have been certified by independent arbiters, namely their mothers, to be actual kids. Let's jump in. So Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, was stuck in prison, but an angel let him out, and he walked over to a home where he knew Christians would be. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. What does that mean, she constantly affirmed that it was even so? Constantly is like, or is like, it's sort of like doing it over and over and over again. Uh, a bunch over and over again? Uh, repeatedly, like, and you won't stop. It means it means stuff like keeps happening. Like uh, I'm constantly hitting a ball at your face. Well, I don't know really. Now the second and last question. I'll read to you some instructions that the Apostle Paul gave to the younger pastor Titus. He tells him about the way Jesus saves us from sin and the way that we will inherit eternal life. And then he says this. These things I will that thou affirm constantly. What does it mean to affirm something constantly? It's like saying, yeah, yeah, this is so, this is so, this is so, over and over again. Um, just over and over again, you know, same as last time. It means you're like, um, saying that this happened, like, I saw a dragon in the sky and you won't stop saying it but people don't believe you. We now have a bit of a usage sample from a young panel, a panel whose reading skills are all above average, I happen to know, except possibly for the littlest member. And for what it's worth, these kids understood this word constantly, exactly as I did until yesterday as I write this script. The word constantly appears three times in the King James Version in precisely that form. I'm going to focus in this video on only the two that I asked the kids about. Rhoda constantly affirmed that Peter was at the gate in Acts 12. And Paul wants Titus to affirm constantly the truths of the gospel. These two passages actually use different Greek words, though the King James translates them the same way into English, which is not a problem, by the way. This video will not argue that the King James translators made a mistake in either one of these passages. I'm certain they did not, unless failing to predict future changes in English and leave a footnote for future generations is a mistake. In Acts 12:15. The relevant Greek word means to be emphatic or resolute about something. You can translate it to insist, to maintain firmly. And this is how the modern translations translate this word. Here's the NIV. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. In Titus 3.8, the relevant Greek word means something very similar. As the one in Acts 12.15, it means to speak confidently, to insist. And this, too, is how the modern translations tend to translate that word in Titus 3.8. Here's the ESV. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. So why did the King James translators choose the word constantly, constantly affirm, affirm constantly? Constantly would seem to be a time reference to say something over and over, as the kids and I all thought, instead of as a reference to the speaker's spirit. That is to say something insistently or confidently. This is a minor difference, but it's a difference. Did Rhoda say the same thing over and over, or did she insist? 
more importantly, are preachers supposed to affirm certain truths over and over again or to insist on those truths? How do contemporary dictionaries define this word? The new Oxford American takes this as I took it my whole life until yesterday, like I said, when a YouTube commenter, uh, Wesley Tyler, I should mention him, pointed it out to me. It says that constantly means continuously over a period of time, always. It gives these sample sentences. The world is constantly changing and he was constantly on her mind. This sense does not fit the Greek in either passage. American Heritage, the American Heritage Dictionary, has multiple senses for this word, including the one that I just read to you from another dictionary. None of these fit the Greek either. Merriam-Webster, however, pretty much solves things for us, if you know what you're looking for, and if you bother to look up this word you already know in the first place, which I never did, the word constantly. Merriam-Webster gives the same time-related sense that I always assumed was being used in Titus and the King James, happening regularly or repeatedly, continual but it also gives an archaic sense and an obsolete one. Archaic, with loyalty, faithfully, and now obsolete, with confidence, firmly. I don't think with loyalty or faithfully quite work in the two contexts that we've brought up, but with confidence, firmly, that obviously works incredibly well. And the Oxford English Dictionary, of course, nails it to the wall and throws dozens of darts mercilessly at its heart. The Oxford English Dictionary presents this sense, with assurance or certitude, confidently, firmly, assuredly. It names this sense as obsolete. We have false friend number 74 on my list of 50 false friends in the King James Version. D actually lists Acts 12, 15 in the 1611 King James as one of the example uses of this obsolete sense. It also gives an example from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. I do constantly believe you. I think modern audiences of Shakespeare will find this to sound funny but will not quite know what's being said, even though I think a lot of educated people know that constant used to mean faithful and still does in English. I think few will realize that constantly meant faithfully or firmly. I judge that few will realize that faithfully meant confidently or firmly. That's what Rhoda was doing. She was confidently, firmly, and assuredly insisting that Peter was at the gate. That is what Paul was calling on Titus to do in Titus 3.8, to confidently, firmly, and assuredly insist on the truths of the gracious justification given to us, not for works of righteousness that we have done, but solely through the mercy of God and the sacrifice of Christ. We'll talk more about what Paul was including in that statement. I'm constantly told by defenders of exclusive use of the King James Version that modern versions contain difficult words too although they never seem in interested in doing a comparative count between modern versions and the King James Version as far as how many archaic or difficult words are in it. I'm also constantly asked why I don't mention false friends in modern versions. It's because, by and large, they don't exist. And when they do, they're holdovers from the King James. But here in Titus 3.8, two modern versions do retain this false friend. Not surprisingly, both are direct revisions of the King James Version. The New King James Version and the Modern English Version use this word constantly. I might need to start a YouTube series called Five False Friends in KJV Revisions. I'm also constantly told by King James defenders that I should be able to learn the meaning of false friends from context. And there's some truth here. In fact, one of my little helpers in my usage panel did just this. She got the gist from the story. I haven't showed you everything that she said she kind of went on, some of the kids did. She talked about how Rhoda talked to the early Christians while Peter waited outside, adding, which might normally push somebody, but then it's like, but then it's like, but then she's insisting, so it's kind of, you know, yeah. That idea of insisting is practically demanded by the context. I don't think my misunderstanding of this passage was significant, Acts 12, frankly, because we're not talking about doctrine. We're talking about a minor point in a neat story, a point that is clear enough even despite my small misunderstanding. But Titus 3.8 is a bit different. It is for me anyway, because I am a Christian preacher. I am very, very sensitive to the question of what truths I should preach and then leave in people's hands and what truths I should insist upon. I gave a talk on dating, for example, to the teens at my church. I was asked to do so. And I made a very clear line between cultural practices I think are wise, like involving both sets of parents in the dating relationship, and truths I insist on, like the necessity for sexual chastity 
So, does Paul in Titus 3.8 tell Titus to affirm certain things over and over or to insist on those things confidently, firmly, assuredly? There's a difference. It's not huge, I admit, but there's a nuance here that I'd like to get as a preacher and like to communicate to others. And I did not get it when I read the King James Version for my entire life. Titus 3.8 is one of countless King James phrases that landed in my memory despite, I assume, not being in a Wana memory verse. Why would they do that? But because of language change, I misunderstood it. It didn't even occur to me that I might be wrong. As I say so often, it is incredibly difficult to make yourself remember to question the first meaning that comes to your mind regarding a word that you use constantly. I checked several modern commentators and one Reformation era commentator. They pointed back to everything in Titus 3 as the things that Titus is supposed to insist on. That would include, for example, being submissive to rulers and authorities, being obedient, being ready for every good work, speaking evil of no one, avoiding quarreling, being gentle, showing perfect courtesy toward all people. That would include our knowledge of our own pre-Christian lives as foolish and disobedient slaves to sin and hatred. That would include the precious gospel itself, the by faith alone gospel that Paul so beautifully describes. These are the things that Paul tells Titus to insist upon, to confidently affirm, to major on. These are all non-negotiables in the Christian life. In order to insist on these things, they're going to have to be repeated constantly. That's true. <laughs> but that's not what Paul said. He told Titus to insist. I know I sometimes see fine distinctions in meaning between Elizabethan English and contemporary English. Which yet again is kind of annoying, but still, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of shows that somebody probably either is mad, as in like, but, or that they know what they're seeing. I'm pretty sure it's the latter. I don't really get why they don't just like go into like, why he doesn't just go to the gate and let him in and cause it's not safe for him to be out there. 